Good morning and welcome to worship. Just one announcement today, and that is to say that this is actually our final video. So a very big thank you to Paul and Elaine and everybody who put so much work into making and producing and distributing the videos. Uh, I'll be on holidays for the next couple of weeks and it really wasn't fair to ask anybody else to do the videos. So we would ask you if you can come to church to come, if you can come and sit in the car park and listen on the radio, do that. It, it encourages everybody to see one another even in the car park. And if none of those options are right for you, then if you wouldn't mind we're using the radio and TV services or the moderator's service um, each week for the next, uh, over the next month. Uh, and then in August, I'll be back again. But we'll, we'll, we'll see how we go without the videos, at least for the moment. Lord, you have made us for yourself. Keep our hearts restless till they find their rest in you. Lift up your hearts to the Lord. Let us worship God. And our opening hymn this morning is Father God, we worship you. And let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we gather in thankfulness to praise and worship you this morning. You are the God who comes to us, the God who seeks and finds us, who touches our hearts and minds and invites us to come to you. You are the one who transforms our lives as we trust and obey you. You help us to see things in a new way. Help us now to listen for the word you have for us today, even or especially if it's not what we expected, and to respond so that we may go out in power to love you and to bring your love to others. And we confess, Lord, that too often we deafen ourselves to you because we think we already know what you will say. Forgive us, Lord. Help us to be open to you, showing us something we did not already know or think, so that we may live lives that are full of love and unafraid. We ask it in Jesus' name, and together aloud we pray as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Well, good morning, girls and boys. I hope you're well. I hope you are happy. I hope you are enjoying some uh, the good weather, generally speaking. 
And here is what I want to tell you today. After Jesus died and then rose again from death and then went off to heaven, his followers spent the rest of their lives telling other people about how God loved them. Because that was really great news for people because they didn't always know that. They didn't know that God loved them. And so Jesus' disciples went to tell them this. Because Jesus helps us to love and to let go of all the bad and the mean and the unkind and unhappy things that make us feel like God doesn't really love us or that make us feel like we can't love other people or we can't even love ourselves. So many of Jesus' disciples wanted to go out and to tell everybody, God does love you. And that helped everybody to love themselves and to love other people as well. Well, in that part of the world where Jesus' friends grew up, a lot of them grew up believing that there were certain kinds of food that God said you shouldn't eat. Those were called unclean foods. Well, the good thing was that these food rules helped people to think about God every time they sat down and had a meal. They were obeying God and they were only eating the right kind of food. But the bad side of it was, or the tricky side of it was, that it meant that they couldn't eat with people who didn't have the same food rules. Because if they went to somebody else's house who didn't have those food rules, then they couldn't really have a meal with them in case some of the food was the food they weren't supposed to eat by their food rules. Well, one of the friends was called Peter, and Peter wanted to obey God, so he didn't eat all those things. But one day, while Peter was asleep, he was hungry and he was waiting for his dinner, and he just kind of fell off into a bit of a sleep, and he had this dream. And in the dream, he saw, it was kind of like a blanket or a tablecloth or something coming down with all the kinds of foods that he had always grown up thinking were unclean and he shouldn't eat them. And a voice from heaven said, get up, Peter, eat. And Peter said, oh, no, 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 I'd never eat that. No, Lord, I, I don't eat those foods. They're unclean. And the voice said, do not call unclean anything that God has made clean. And the dream then happened all over again. And it happened a third time. And then Peter woke up and he was thinking, what was that all about? What does that mean? What was God telling me? And just as he was wondering about this, he heard this a knock at the door. And a messenger was there inviting Peter to go to the house of a man called Cornelius because Cornelius wanted to hear all about Jesus. Now, Cornelius was from a different place, and they didn't have those food rules. And suddenly, Peter knew the meaning of his dream. God was teaching him to see things in a new way. God was teaching him not to let things like food rules separate people from each other. Actually, God was teaching him to see everyone in a whole new way. No more us who have these particular rules, and them who don't have those rules. No, there is only us. He gradually realized that's what God was teaching him. That God was teaching him, there's only us, because we all belong to each other, because we all belong to God. And that is the most important thing. Jesus came to show love, not just for some people, but for the whole world for everyone. And from then on, Peter and Paul and all the other disciples, they taught everybody that Jesus wants us all to have meals and to have get-togethers. In fact, we even have a meal in church called Holy Communion. And it's all about learning that we all belong together and we all share in Jesus because Jesus loves us all. And we learn more about God's love not by keeping apart from each other, but by being together and letting Jesus hold us together. So it was a really big thing that Peter learnt in his dream from God that day. 
And actually, God taught him to see things in a new way lots of times during his life. There's other stories in the Bible, especially in the book of Acts, that tell us about Peter learning to see things and to see people in a new way. And you know, even today, God is still teaching us and all of his people to see things in a way that we hadn't fully seen them before. God is always teaching us to see a little more and a little more about his love every day because God's love is so big that you would never know it all. We've always got a bit more and a bit more to learn. So let's pray. Thank you, God, that your love is so big that we always have more to learn about it. Help us to learn to love you more every day. Amen. And so now we're going to sing, Praise Him, Praise Him. Our scripture reading today is from Luke's Gospel at chapter 7 and beginning to read at verse 18. At this stage, John the Baptist has been imprisoned by Herod. So let's listen for God's word to us through the scripture. John's disciples told him all about these things. Calling two of them, he sent them to the Lord to ask, Are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect somebody else? When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, are you the one who was to come? Or should we expect someone else? At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, go back and report to John, what you have heard and seen. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the one who does not fall away on account of me. After John's messengers left, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxuries are in palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Yet, the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. All the people, even the tax collectors, when they heard Jesus' words, acknowledged that God's way was right, because they had been baptized by John. But the Pharisees and experts in the law rejected God's purpose for themselves because they had not been baptized by John. To what then can I compare this people of this generation? What are they like? 
They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to each other, We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you would not cry. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine and you say, He has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking and you say, Here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her children. Amen. And may God bless to us this reading from his word. There's a story about a prairie chicken who somehow came across an abandoned eagle's egg and sat on it until it hatched. Now, while eagles soar majestically to great heights in the sky, prairie chickens can't actually fly at all. They forage around amongst the dirt and the dust for food. Having grown up amongst prairie chickens, the little eagle thought that he was a prairie chicken too. And he pecked around in the dust and the dirt, just like all the others. One day, he looked up and saw a magnificent eagle soaring through the air, dipping and swooping and diving. For a moment, the eagle chick felt a restlessness and a longing to be up there too. But with a shrug of resignation, it went back to pecking in the dirt. At moments all through its life, it would look up and now and then see an eagle amongst the clouds. And it would long to be up there too. Sometimes it even spread its wings for a moment. But then it would think, nah, I could never be like that. I'll stick with what I know. And back it went to grubbing around in the dirt. If only that little eagle had responded to the longing and the desire that it felt. If only it had heeded the disturbing restlessness that made it feel uncomfortable with its life that pointed it beyond the very limited life that it was living to the far more wonderful life that it was actually made for. Its life could have been so different. Very often God breaks into the life of the world and indeed into our individual lives to wake us up when we're drifting in a dreamlike way towards disaster or towards just unfulfillment. And God disturbs us to call us into life, life that is fulfilling, life of love, life that really matters. Time and again, God disturbs us and prompts us to look afresh at our lives. And hopefully, if we're wise, we'll all look for the lessons of this pandemic that we're all going through. What does God want us to notice? What is life draining about the way we have been living? What is life giving about what we've learned? The Church of Scotland hymn writer and minister, the Reverend John Bell, writes thought-provoking hymns. One of them is a variation on God rest ye, merry gentlemen. John Bell's hymn goes, God bless us and disturb us. He sees God's disturbance as a blessing, calling us to more. Way, way back in history, a Christian leader prayed, Lord, keep our hearts restless until they find their restless, until they find their rest in you. And a prayer that's been around for over a century goes, Lord, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Through the Holy Spirit, God gives us desires and longings and curiosity that make us restless, that call us beyond our comfort zones, to question things that we've always assumed to be certainties, things which maybe give us a false sense of security. A bit like on Pentecost Day when the Holy Spirit came amongst the disciples, disturbing them, setting their hearts on fire, urging them to move beyond the small locked room where they tried to feel safe by locking the door and keeping themselves in, and urging them to move out, to go beyond the small locked room where they tried to feel safe, 
and urging them into the wider world outside, the heaving city of Jerusalem, bubbling and bursting with diversity. People from all lands and cultures, unable to understand each other, and the Holy Spirit disturbed and disrupted the disciples, but freed them from their fear, enabled them to speak in ways that everyone understood. And I always think it's really interesting that the Holy Spirit did not make the people on the street able to speak the disciples' language. Rather, the Holy Spirit opened up the disciples' hearts and minds and voices to enable them both to understand and to communicate to all the diversity of people that were out there. John the Baptist had been open to God's leading all his life. People probably thought it was certain that he would follow his father Zechariah's footsteps and become a priest just like his father. Instead, John let the Holy Spirit disturb that expectation and lead him into a very different ministry in the desert. Courageously, he spoke out against things that were wrong, including against the very corrupt leader, Herod, at the time. John's ministry helped many people to find hope and to come closer to God and to find fulfillment in their lives. When Jesus came along, John immediately recognized and named him as the Messiah, the Savior. And he urged his own followers, don't follow me, follow him. And yet, all of that faithful ministry landed John the Baptist in a horrendous jail, utterly at the mercy of the tyrannical Herod. As he languished in prison, John, who always had been so certain and so fearless, suddenly found himself very uncertain. He had been sure that the Messiah would come along and would conquer all these corrupt powers, would become ruler, and would bring in a reign of godliness, a reign of goodness. But it wasn't working out according to John's expectations. So from his prison, he sent a messenger to ask Jesus, are you the one after all? Was I right to think that you were the Messiah? Should I trust you? Should I tell others to trust you? Or was I mistaken? You just don't seem to be the Messiah I was expecting you to be. And what is Jesus' answer to John? Does he give him a big, complicated theological explanation? No. He doesn't make any attempt to tell John what to believe. Instead, Jesus just tells John to notice. To notice what Jesus is doing in people's lives and the difference that he's making. He tells John to let go of the picture he had in his mind about how the Messiah would be and how the Messiah would act and how the Messiah would speak, and instead to use his ears and his eyes and to listen to his heart. Jesus knew that John truly knew him. He had known him since they were both babies in the womb. Remember how John had jumped for joy when Mary had come pregnant with Jesus. An old Irish proverb says, Ni mara heel terbeter. Things don't always be the way you expected them to be. In other words, to be open to God's new vision, to what God is showing us, to notice how God is at work all around us, often in ways and often through people that we least expect. John's horrendous imprisonment and subsequent gruesome death would have tempted many people to start doubting G John's message, to think, oh, it must be God must have abandoned him. He mustn't have been doing things right for God. And so Jesus says, no, no. Jesus probably could hear some of the murmuring going on. Oh, 
that John fellow's in prison now. Hmm. Mustn't have been really God's prophet. And so Jesus says, no, no, I'm telling you. John is greater than any man who's ever lived. His terrible circumstances are not a sign of God's disfavor. Rather, God has worked through John to speak to the world. Yes, if we use our ears and our eyes, what do we see? The seemingly powerful rulers of that day are all but forgotten. Whereas John the Baptist is remembered and is honored and God still speaks to us about himself through his life and through his ministry. So what about us? At times we can feel unsettled and unsure what we're supposed to believe, especially when some of our former certainties, the way we thought things were, turn out to be not quite so clear cut after all. There's a lot more cream and gray when we thought it was black and white. When our former certainties are shaken, we can feel unsettled. Jesus does not say that John was wrong. He just urges him to look beyond his old certainties, to see more, to see an even more wonderful picture and to find a deeper certainty of God's power and God's presence and God's healing at work in the world. The Messiah, yes, he was right. The Messiah is come. The Messiah is already establishing God's reign in the world but not necessarily in the way that John had thought it would be. But nevertheless, very powerfully, even more than John had expected. And so for us, when our view of the world or even our faith is disturbed and shaken as it is at times, it's very tempting to try to rebuild the walls, to rebuild the old picture as it were or indeed to turn away and think that we were deluded. It was all a false delusion. But Jesus' message to John is also his message to us. Be open. Open your eyes and your ears and your hearts to notice what God is actually doing in your life and in the world all around you. Come closer to God. Do not be fooled by the tempter into turning away. Come closer to God and ask him to help you see more than you saw before. Ask him to open your mind and your heart to even greater wonders than you imagined and to find a deeper, wider, more inclusive faith in his loving presence in you and in the world all around you often in places you least expected to find it, and amongst people you didn't expect to find it. A faith that opens you to join joyfully in his healing, loving, redeeming work in the world every day. Amen. And may God bless us with the preaching of his word. And let us pray. Lord, Help us to open our hearts to the disturbance of your Holy Spirit. Help us to let you enable us to see anew, to notice what you want us to see that we had not seen before. We pray for our loved ones and ourselves. Heavenly Father, we pray for the church locally here in Scarva and Loch Brickland. And just take a moment to pray for the people who usually sit near us in church or who are here if you're in the church. And we pray for those who are unable to be with us. We pray for all the congregations of your people in Ireland and in Britain and all around the world gathering to worship you this morning. Lord, help us all to be true to you ready to let you teach us more of the wideness of your mercy and love and your welcome to all people. Help us to treat each other with your love and to see your face in the faces of all those we meet, 
even in those with whom we find it difficult to get along. May we bear witness to the acceptance and the transforming power of you, Christ. We pray for our community, for people who are stressed and unable to deal with their difficulties, for those who seek comfort in the wrong ways, for those who are fearful. Father, give us grace to notice and to take up the opportunities you open up to us to reach out to one another and to all your people. Through our concern and our actions, may those you send into our lives know how dearly you value them. We pray for our families and our loved ones, and all who are ill. And we bring before you now any special needs that you place on our hearts at this time. And we give thanks for all the ways you brought healing and broke down barriers, touching lepers, those considered unclean, eating and drinking and having to do with those who are outside the mainstream of your community, proclaiming forgiveness. Thank you for all the ways you show us that your power to heal and to free is vastly greater than the world's power to hurt and to bind. Thank you for all the ways that you have reached to us to show us how much we matter to you. For all who have lived this life trusting in you, and especially for those who are dearest to us and who are already gone ahead of us to be forever with you. Keep us close to you in this life that we too may join with them for all eternity in the joy of your immediate presence. And all of these things we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. So we sing together, Glory be to God the Father.
And now go back out into the world to love and to serve God and all your neighbours. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all forever and ever. Amen.